Yep. We should be good to go. Okay, so the GI track, and it's funny because we're actually talking about this in physiology, or just finished talking about it in physiology, but if you remember these structures, all of these structures, mouth, esophagus, stomach, small intestine, large intestine, rectum, anus, are these all of the GI organs? No. What are all of these called? They're the accessory organs? No, they're called the primary organs. Yeah, these are primary because you can actually put the food in this organ and it moves all the way through that tract. So they make up the GI tract and they're the primary organs. Where the, the, all of these. Yep, they're all primary organs because the food actually travels through them. The accessory organs just help out. What are good accessory organ examples? Gallbladder, liver, pancreas, yep. Even the teeth and salivary glands are considered accessory because the food never goes inside those structures. The way I always remember primary versus accessory was that if I ate a marble, whatever that marble went through is a primary. Mouth, pharynx, esophagus, all the way down until it dropped out the other end. It never goes in my liver. Never goes in my gallbladder, never goes in the pancreas, never goes in the salivary gland, gland or in my teeth. Those are all accessories. So there's your passageway. The second thing you want to make sure to remember are the different layers. There are four primary layers in the GI tract. There's the mucosal layer, which makes the mucus that also helps with absorption. There's the one that's under the mucus called the submucosa, which has the blood vessels and when the food's absorbed past the mucosa, it goes into those blood vessels. What are the three major food that you absorb? Carbs, proteins, lipids. Yep. So when you break those carbs into simple monosaccharides, they go over, they go to the blood vessels, and then they go where? Once they penetrate into the GI wall, they go to what organ? The liver. Everything you absorb from the GI tract goes to that hepatic portal vein, hepatic portal system, and goes up to the liver to be cleaned and processed. When you take a, a monosaccharide, simple carb, and you absorb it, when you take it in What's the uh, basic, what's an amino acid made? Proteins, right? I was trying to do it the other way around, speed it up, but yeah. So you take a protein, you break it to an amino acid, then you absorb it and it goes up to the liver. Processed, cleaned, stored, and then fats. When you absorb them, where can they go besides the liver? To the heart, through what system? The lymphatics. Yep, so they can go to the lymphatics. You turn them into chylomicrons, HDLs, LDLs, and you pump them straight up to the heart. They don't have to be clean and processed. They just get pushed up into the heart and go into the circulation. And these things are packed with cholesterol, so it can actually be dangerous. But the submucosa has those little fats in it, too. The next layer is the muscularis, which is full of muscle, and then the outside is serosa. And the serosa is really important because it gives like a fluid emotion to the GI tract. Your GI tract is not always fixed. It's always kind of like sliding over itself constantly. If you turn the stuff into scar tissue, what happens that stretchability, flexibility, that lip, like fluid motion. Yeah, it's lost. Scar tissue turns into glue, basically. So if the cirrhosis are getting covered with scar tissue, and it starts sticking together, what happens to the motility of food? It slows down. You can't get that flexibility, so you can't pump the food. Diseases that we'll talk about the last week in class, things like endometriosis. Endometriosis, who gets that? Women, right? It's because uterine lining actually goes into the abdominal cavity, it sticks to the serosa, and then every month when estrogen comes out, it's a thickening. It becomes more and more glue. It replicates. What's it doing to her intestines? It's scarring them all up and turning them into like glued together organs. So it causes GI problems too. Endometriosis does. It's because that serosa gets bound. Same thing when they do abdominal surgeries. Surgeons don't like to do abdominal surgeries because once you start cutting around that, what's that tissue going to turn into? You can't do a surgery and gain exactly the same motility. You always create a scar when you go into the abdomen like that. Okay, and then here are the purposes. The four main. Anybody remember the four main purposes of the GI tract? Motility, absorption, secretion, and digestion. Those are the main processes. So all of these can fall into it. So when you look at something like digestion, there's biochemical digestion, there's mechanical digestion, 
Motility's propulsion is also mixing, but they all fall into those four groups. Okay, so clinical manifestations are the first section. So all the physical signs of a GI, we went from extreme outside to extreme inside. With the integument system, you can see all the problems that were happening out there. You, know, you see you have a problem right away, and we all get freaked out when we go to dermatologists and have it removed or fixed as fast as possible. With the GI tract, you can have something accumulating or coming, you know, building up over years and years and years. But here are some of the signs and symptoms. The one's anorexia, and it's not... We associate anorexia with psychological disorders, like men or women that are trying to look really good so they, they don't eat anything. It's a control issue. If you have taken psychology, anorexia is control. These people are obsessed about control, where bulimics actually lose control, and then what do they do to fix it? They binge and purge. But anorexia is not just a disease. It's actually a symptom, too, because people that have cancer, we talked about anorexia. It was part of what was that C word? Cachexia, right? So cachexia was the pain, the anorexia, the anemia, all those bad things that come with cancer. Anorexia is a physical symptom of some other problems. Like, if somebody has irritation of the GI tract, what's to do your appetite? It turns it down. And if you have irritation for weeks, what happens to your weight? You don't want to eat, so you decrease weight. So if it decreases to a dangerous point, we call it anorexia. So it's actually a symptom as well as a disease. And then vomiting, another sign of something wrong going on there. The vomiting involves what part of the brain? Do you remember? Hiccuping, choking, coughing, gagging, vomiting, heart rate, breathing. The medulla oblongata. So if there's something irritating the GI tract, it'll send a signal up to the medulla oblongata and it may cause you to vomit. It's trying to clear whatever that toxic substance is. So it can be something as simple as iron. I mean, if you're if you're going through like some rapid red blood cell breakdown in your body, and you're pushing lots of iron into your GI tract, it could also cause upset stomach. So vomiting is not just because of something you ate; it can actually be a physical sign of other damage to the GI tract or your sense in there. I'm trying to think of another. Do they sell syrup of epicac in stores anymore? When I was a kid, a friend of mine knew how that stuff worked, and that was his ticket out of school whenever he wanted to. Yeah. Bastard was brilliant. <laughs> I was still trying the thermometer on a, a light bulb, and it never worked for me. 150 degrees? I don't think so. What? Syrup of Epcac? Uh -huh. it, it's such an irritant to the stomach lining that it, it triggers these receptors and the signal to do album God, and the medulla tries to vomit it back up. Um, Force limping in the stomach is, what was that swallowing motion, that slow pulsion through your GI tract? Peristalsis. Vomiting is not just the reverse of peristalsis. Vomiting, you open the esophagus, you just relax it. You open up all the sphincters in the pathway between the mouth and the stomach and then squeeze with all three layers of the stomach. So, I can't even think of a good example of smashing. Um, when you stretch the stomach too rapidly, what's it want to do? Do you remember this from physiology? It wants to contract back. If you slowly fill it at a Chinese restaurant one bite at a time with that fluidy Chinese food that's already like way processed and it, it slowly moves into your small intestine, you're okay. You can, like I swear it's like a gallon, right? But in reality, three plates is about a liter of food. But if you try and chug a milk gallon, what happens? All those proteins start falling up in your stomach. They start building up and then before you know it, that rapid stretching does what? Makes you vomit. What happens if you inhale a lot of like dry particles, like dusty particles? Cinnamon. <laughs> Same idea. That lines your all the way down from the pharynx to the esophagus down in the stomach. It lines that with these little irritating chemicals. You know, that cinnamon is kind of stingy, kind of burning. And then when you line your airway with all that dry particle, then you start uh, uh, like coughing, and then it becomes the stomach. So there are a lot of things that contribute to vomiting. Just even brain swelling to the brain stem we talked about in the nervous system. If it irritates the medulla oblongata, it starts misfiring and causes things like vomiting. And then nausea is the actual feeling without the vomit. And what's it mean that it's subjective? You can't see it, right? As a medical professional, you can't measure it. So can they fake it? 
you ever told your parents, oh, I have such an upset stomach? You ever sent your instructor email saying, oh, I'm so sick today, I'm not going to make it? <laughs> right. It's nausea. We can't prove that. You say vomiting, we want to sample. <laughs> so it's subjective, which means it can be faked. It's just that upset stomach feeling. But. And it's interesting because the real nausea, if it's severe, you actually start salivating a lot. Like right before you do what? Vomit. You start drooling. Your mouth gets all liquidy. You're lubricating the pathway so it's not so harsh. And then tachycardia, your blood starts pumping a little bit faster. Your heart's cranking up the, the beats. And then retching. And unfortunately, I've only vomited a few times in my life, but man, you don't forget that. And that retching kind of sensation where you're like, oh, here it comes. And you think, ooh, rather, ooh. And then it's out. Right? So you've got the nausea, nausea, the retching, and then the vomiting. Nausea is the upset stomach. The retching is like the unproductive or non-productive movement. And then the vomit itself is the actual proportion of the stomach contents. And then this is always a fun one. So projectile vomiting. Who's this usually happen to? Yeah, little kids, babies. And I love that it's spontaneous. So, honey, did you finish your cereal? <laughs> there it is. And then just the opposite end. So constipation and, of course, diarrhea. By the way, with vomiting, what's the worst symptom or the worst problems? I don't even say symptoms. What's the worst physiological problem with vomiting? You're losing what? You're losing well, yeah. You're losing nutrients. You're losing acids, which means what's left in your body? A lot of base. So what's that called when you build up bases in your body? Alkalosis. And then what else are you losing with the acid? Lots of water. So what's the other problem with vomiting? Dehydration. And then constipation is when the GI tract's moving what? Too fast or too slow? Too slow. And even you consciously holding it for too long can cause constipation. If you don't remember, you should go back and look at the defecation reflex. You actually have some control over it. And if you hold it for too long, and it backs everything up, and then you just pull more and more water out, and you're making bricks, basically. Okay. So it can be caused by lots of different things. It can be caused because of things like stress. Just stress. Why would stress cause your GI tract to slow down? Huh? You don't even have to think hormones. Sympathetic nervous system. What's it doing to your GI tract? Slowing your GI tract down. So living a high stress lifestyle, the next time you see something that looks really constipated, say, oh, you must be really stressful. You look so constipated. Uh, sadness will do that too. So neurological, just psychological ne neurology type of things. Sadness causes constipation. Oh, honey, you look so constipated. You must be really sad. What's interesting is anger actually does exactly the opposite. So st high stress, high sadness, constipation, but high anger usually leads to diarrhea, like symptoms, excessive movement. That's just an interesting thing. Yeah, so something about the sympathetic, parasympathetic treat anger different than, than stress. Okay, moving along, there's the diarrhea. With diarrhea, what you also want to remember, you can look at the different types, like osmotic diarrhea. What's, it, what's osmotic referring to? Water. Yeah. So osmotic <laughs> diarrhea means that it's because of the water in there. There's way too much water, and it's pushing a lot of water out. It doesn't mean that you're necessarily going to the bathroom way more frequently. It's more diarrhea. You're losing lots of water. Secretory diarrhea is because Secretions are coming out in the GI tract. And then the motility is just the speed of the GI tract. So if you took something that stimulated what? Sympathetic or parasympathetic? What would turn up? I'm sorry, I guess I should finish that. What would turn up the GI activity? Parasympathetic. Do you remember the name of the chemical? The neurotransmitter is associated with the parasympathetic? Acetylcholine. Yeah, so if you took something that acted like acetylcholine, it would actually speed up your GI tract, causing what? Constipation or diarrhea? Diarrhea. If you've ever heard of, how do you take pharmacology? A couple of you. Did they talk about sludge in pharmacology? If you take something that's, that acts like acetylcholine, it causes sludge. Oh man, how could you ever, if you, if you heard it, you'd probably never forget it. Nerve gas is a good example of it. Yep. ACH, um, anything that stimulates ACH, even eye drops, 
have chemicals in them that act like acetylcholine. If you put it in your GI tract, what's it going to do to your GI tract? Speed it up. Yep. And so if, when it gets in the stomach, it's going to make the stomach really irritated and probably make you want to do what? Vomit. Yeah, it causes nausea and vomit, an uncomfortable feeling. When it gets in the small intestine, it's going to start shuttling the food through way too quickly, which causes diarrhea. Yep. And what symptom comes with nausea right before you, before you vomit? Salivation. Have you ever vomited? You can't help but have a little tear, cry a little bit when you do it. Maybe it's because that carrot is wedged in your nose, but that's only part of it. Just me, huh? It's always a carrot. It doesn't matter how long it's been since you eat a carrot, there's always a carrot to vomit. Always. There was, I think it was Jim Brewer actually made a joke about that, too. But it doesn't matter. There's always a hot dog, is what he says. There's always a hot dog in there. But. What they call it S, salivate, L for lactromate, U for urinate, D for defecate, G for GI upset, and E for emesis. Or emesis. What's that? Vomiting. Yeah, sludge. All those different factors. When you turn up acetylcholine in the GI tract, it causes these factors like nerve gas does. So it makes them nauseous, vomiting, diarrhea, losing lots and lots of fluid. Yeah, which is an ACH inhibitor. But motility is just an example. If you took something that sped up the GI tract, it doesn't matter. You could maybe you don't have any toxins in there. Maybe there's nothing wrong. It's just highly active GI tract. Um, what do they call that? There's a psychological symptom that causes people to have to go to the bathroom a lot when they're stressed. Don't know what they get. Um, irritable bowel is a little bit different. I'm trying to think. I have a nervous bladder. They say I have a nervous bladder, nervous bowel. How do they work? There's some name for it. I can't remember what it is. It's not going to be out of test. So. But it's just, it's one of those situations where it doesn't matter what they ate. They could have eaten a block of cheese. They could have eaten, you know, water. It doesn't matter. Just because they get nervous or, or whatever, they get this motility diarrhea where it just moves through their body way too fast. And of course, with diarrhea, you're losing nutrients, but you're also losing what? The stomach loses acid. But the small intestine and the large intestine release bases. So if you're constantly releasing bases, what's staying behind in the body? Acid. So acidosis. And then still water. So losing nutrients, losing water, and then losing bases, so you get acidosis. Yeah, there's another name for it with the, when it's the bowel, though, and I just can't, I'm having a brain fart. No pun intended. Huh? <clears throat> there was a, there was a Seinfeld episode. Oh, was there? I've only seen like three or four Seinfeld episodes. I always want to say they're probably the best ones, but I guess more people say they're all the best. Um, okay. And then abdominal pain. So cramping, irritation of the lining. So parietal and visceral. Parietal is talking about the outer layer, so it's in the actual abdominal cavity, where visceral is actually talking about the organ itself. And then we've talked about referred pain before. Like... With referred pain, it means it's doing what with the pain sensation? Typically, it sends it, well, elsewhere, yeah, where usually, like with the kidneys, where does it send it? To the back. It makes it feel more superficial. So these pains usually feel a little bit more superficial in areas. Not always, but usually. GI bleeding. So where it's coming from is actually, it looks different. That's the best way to say it. So if you're bleeding into your upper GI tract, that blood's being exposed to lots and lots of acids. And acids, if you ever take a chemistry class, when they refer to something being cooked in acid, do they mean they boil the acid? Nope. It can be ice cold acid, like really, really, really freezing cold, borderline freezing cold acid. You put something in it and it will actually cook the product you put it in or put in it. Like if you take a raw egg and you crack it over a stove on heat, it cooks the egg. So you take another egg, crack it into a bowl of you know, 10 degree hydrochloric acid, it will cook the egg right in front of you. So when you put something, huh? What is that? I don't know what that is. Oh. Oh yeah, I know. I didn't, I didn't know that was a name for it, but I know what you're talking about. I actually found a recipe for that. Where you chop it up into small pieces so the, the lime juice has full exposure. Yeah. Still makes me a little bit nervous. Parasites are pretty strong sometimes. 
But anyway, yeah, it's an example of when you when you put that egg into an acid, it cooks the eggs, it denatures it. What is blood made out of? Protein. Yeah, it's lots of two hundred fifty million little protein balls, right? Hemoglobin. So when you put that in the stomach, it's going to denature them and change them. And actually, when somebody um, has an in, internal bleed in their stomach and they vomit, it looks like coffee grounds because it's cooked blood, basically, because of stomach acid. So when you have an upper GI bleed, they call it hematemesis, is what you're losing, that coffee ground looking stuff. If, you're, if it's still red, where's it probably at? Where's the bleeding at? It's above the stomach. Why above the stomach? Because if it were in the stomach, it would be cooked by the stomach acid. So it could actually be coming from what? It's not part of the GI tract. From the airway, right? So trachea and the lungs. It might be getting coughed up into the throat and then they end up vomiting and it comes out that way. That's why tomato sauce or tomato paste is like the worst thing to feed a kid when they're sick because why? If they vomit, it looks like bleeding. That's terrifying. But that's hematemesis and it's telling you right in the name. It's blood being vomited. It looks like coffee grounds. Okay. Hematochesia is the opposite end. It's blood colored stool. And down there, it's usually more of a reddish color, red tone. Okay. That's internal bleeding, yeah. It's, these are different signs of bleeding. If you get hematochesia, it's typically a lower intestinal tract. Where you get hematemesis, it's upper, so stomach and up. It could be the duodenum, but it's typically stomach and up. Okay, and then the melena is, melena is actually technically the coffee ground. So hematomesis is the vomiting of the blood, the, the way you describe it is melena. And then fecal occult bleeding is when they bleed, you can test the stool. The stool doesn't look more red, but when you test it, there's actually hemoglobin in the stool. So when they take a test just in case and they find that there's fecal occult, that means that you're in front of bleeding somewhere, it's just not showing up. It's that rude enough. So hidden boys and other things. Don't worry about the flow charts. Right. Let's go through each of the organs. We'll talk about the problems. So the first one's the esophagus. What's actually above the esophagus that's part of the GI tract? There are two things. First is the mouth, and then what's the pharynx. Yep. So the first problem. And when you're looking at the esophagus, dysphagia with a G, not S-H, like we talk about in the brain. So remember, dysphagia with an S-H is referring to language, where dysphagia, phage, like macrophage means what? P-H-A-G. To eat, yeah. So like a macrophage is a big eater, dysphagia is dysfunctional eating, dysfunctional swallowing. It's difficult to swallow. Uh, different types of mechanical, so you can actually have a blockage. Functional means that maybe the muscles aren't working appropriately. What part of the brain do you think controls the involuntary swallowing? You know when you take a test and you don't know the right answer? <laughs> and so you write the letter C, or you do C? This part of the brain is like C. If you ever get asked a question that's about a life threat, or something that could potentially kill you, what part of the brain do you really want to go toward? Medulla oblongata. Yeah, so it controls swallowing too. You put something in your mouth and you you can chew it, you can spit it out, that's voluntary. But as soon as you get back to the pharynx, now it's a threat because why? If you don't swallow it, you can't also breathe. So the medulla oblongata detects it's in there, it sends a signal back out and says, perform what? Movement that's like squeezing a toothpaste tube down. Peristalsis. So it's trying to turn off peristalsis to move it down. If you can't move it down, then it says, do what? Try and propel it up. Or vomit, yeah. Cough or vomit. So a mechanical obstruction would be like when you get that carrot stuck in there. Functional is typically something about the mechanics. So neurons are dis dysfunctional. The muscle's not contracting appropriately. The medulla oblongata is out of whack. 
Those are all functional. In an achalatio, what it actually means is failure to reflex. So what would that be under? Would that be under mechanical or functional? It would be functional, yeah. Failure to relax. You're not able to relax the muscles, so you can't get the food down. Like, down here, anybody know what the LES stands for? Lower esophageal stand, right? You have an upper one, and you have a lower one. So if the lower esophageal sphincter, if your medulla oblongata can't, God, I can't say relax, are you going to be able to get the food through it? Nope, it's stuck there. On the upside is that it's down the esophagus, so you can still probably do what? Still breathe. It's going to be tough because remember those cartilaginous rings are actually pushing into the It's going to be a little more difficult to breathe. But you still breathe. The problem is that you can't get it all the way down into the stomach. So it sits there. That would be a type of functional dysphagia. And then here's one where instead of not being able to relax the sphincter, you're not able to squeeze the sphincter. Remember, a sphincter is just a circular muscle. So if you look at the lower top of the sphincter, it's normally closed unless you're actually swallowing food to prevent what from going backwards. The stomach acids, right? The chyme, the acidic property. Your esophagus, is, its pH is just a little bit lower than, than normal, which is 7.0. Neutral. But down in your stomach, it's about 2. So what would happen if that pH of 2 comes up in the esophagus? It's going to start burning it. It's going to start burning at the esophagus. And they call it the gastroesophageal reflux disease. So they can't completely squeeze that sphincter, and then the stomach acid starts steeping upwards. Who else besides people that have this disorder get a lot of stomach acids that come up? Okay. Pregnancy causes going upwards. I was thinking of a disease. Actually, I mentioned earlier psychological disease. Okay. People intentionally bring things back up. Mm-hmm. Bulimics. Yeah. So they get a lot of erosion at the esophagus. They also get a lot of erosion of what structures? Mm-hmm. The teeth. Yeah, from all that stomach acid. Mm-hmm. Stop. <laughs> for bulimia? No, for this. Oh, for this. Yeah, a lot of times what they'll do for the treatment is they'll just try and neutralize the stomach acid, but then the problem with that is if you don't digest food, so there are a lot of different medications. Yeah. Um, I think a lot of people have this problem. Huh? A lot of people have this problem. You hear about it a lot in older age, yeah. which means that what's <laughs> what's going on with that? Just like every other part of our body, the muscles are atrophying. Yeah, they're, just, they're just not able to contract the way they used to, so the food comes back up. Did you have a question, Joe? No, although uh, I'm looking at this right now. Is that common to the lines to be the contents to be actually above the sphincter? Oh, up in here? Yeah. Yeah, you don't, you don't put a lot of air in your stomach, actually. As you put the food in, ideally, you don't introduce much air. If you're, you're, you were a kid and you were a boy at one time, so you drink soda or drink water, and you're actually trying to intentionally bring air in your stomach so you could do what? Burp, right. But, yeah, show off. If you get the whole alphabet, that will show you off. But, so you normally don't want a lot of gas in here. It's, it's going to be pretty much all the way up into the fundus still. Anybody remember how you know the name of the fundus? <sighs> it's exactly, thank you. I love it when people remember my stupid little, little stories. But, yeah, I say that the top of the stomach's like a roller coaster because it's always fundus at the top. <laughs> I love it when people remember my lame things because then people were in class like, oh, that's so lame. But then you know what? Yeah. There it is. <laughs> you need it, it's there for you. <laughs> I had I was out at dinner with somebody that used to be a student a long time ago. We were all sitting around and she goes, God, I still remember that stupid story about your sister in the purse. When You know what I'm talking about? Yes. You know, in the kidney, where you dump the, all the contents out and put 80% right back in immediately in the proximal tubule. She's like, oh, I could not get rid of that. And then she said she took a test, and then there it was. She's like, oh, I hate it when you pop back in my head. But thanks. Okay. So we got GERD under control. Uh-huh. Oh, I already did this one. There we go. Okay, the next one. So hiatal hernia. With a hernia... What type of hernia do you usually hear about? Yes, different types of abdominal. So 
you have different types of abdominal hernias where you have a, a seam that doesn't completely close and then the intestines actually start squirting out. This is the same concept, but you can't see it outside. What happens is, what's that muscle? It comes right across above the stomach. The diaphragm. And so you've got this little passageway for the esophagus to go through. If the esophagus bends over itself, or if the stomach bends over itself and pushes up through the hole in the diaphragm, it can actually herniate like this, and it can pinch off. When you look at this, you have one that's called sliding hiatal hernia, where it comes and goes. It shifts up, and it gets a little bit of GERD backed up, but it can go away. The problem is that when you have something that's a parasophageal hiatal hernia, the word you want to write down that is not up there. I don't think it's on the next slide either. It's called strangulation. Nope, it's not on the next slide either. So if something like this happens, and you pinch this area of the stomach off, all these blood vessels, what do you think happens to them? They get pinched too. What happens to the flow of to this upper section? This decreases. So what's going to happen to that tissue? It's dead. Yeah, it's going to die. So the stomach contents can actually start penetrating through, eating a hole in there, and then the really going to go into the abdominal cavity or the thoracic cavity at that point. So sliding hiatal hernias, usually they have a tendency to correct themselves. The paraesophageal, not so much. So this one is actually folded over itself and it's kind of pinched there. And it's strangulation is the big thing you have to worry about. So if you kill off that part of the stomach and you've got problems. Between sliding hiatal? Yeah. Sliding usually comes and goes kind of like this. Like you can, you can fold it out and then it goes back away. Where the parasophageal means it's folded over next to the esophagus. Oh, so it's so actually it's folded it's over. So the horn doesn't really turn into the second one. Right. Two different yeah, they're two different things. Oh. Yep. The, the sliding is A and then B is the parasophageum. And then strangulation is what you have to worry about with the parasophageum. Okay, next organ is stomach. So, one problem pyloric obstructions. What's, where's pyloric? What does it mean? We already talked about fundus at the top. What do you call the middle part? The body. The storage, and then down at the bottom is the open A. Antrum. Yep. And the pyloric region is the part that has the most of that movement and grinding. And I always think of the stomach being like a blender. You put the large objects in the top, and down here where all the blending and the massive churning happens, where it gets what? Mm -hmm. What happens at the bottom of the blender? Everything turns to like, liquid. So you want this liquefied at the bottom. As this turns liquid, it'll come back up and pull the big chunks out and keep pulling back in. But the pyloric region where most of that grinding, like the, the liquefying, is actually happening. Okay. So if you get a pyloric obstruction, that means the pyloric sphincter, the round muscle here, is not <coughs> relaxing. And you can't move beyond that. So if you keep eating, but you can't empty, what's going to happen here? Yeah, you get feelings or sensations of fullness. When it's time to eat, you're like, gosh, you know, I just feel really full. And then you eat, you eat a couple bites, you're like, oh, I feel terribly full. And it's just like that every time you eat. It's be a sign of high work of destruction. You have clearing frozen. And then unfortunately, then when it gets too full, you vomit, and then there was yesterday's breakfast still in your stomach. Mm -hmm. Always a bad sign. Did you see the Oh, really? Nasty. Yeah, and what absorbs in the stomach? What nutrients absorb in the stomach? I like to think of alcohol as a nutrient too, so I'm with you. <laughs> but, right, you can absorb some alcohol in the stomach, but as far as nutrients, there are none. Alcohol and aspirin, that's, that's about it, if it's acidic. But if it's basic, like most multivitamins and stuff, or pills that have that basic liner around it, that's okay. I had a friend that worked at a, a sewage treatment plant, and he they called them... Well, the doctor version called them bedpan bolus, but like cinch. I mean, one of those label multivitamins out there, they're packed so densely you can't actually break them apart. So you can still read the, the name right on the side of the pill at the sewage treatment plant. Water, alcohol, and some acidic things like aspirin. Yeah, aspirin, salicylic acid. Um. And if you remember from wherever you took physiology, or for me, I always give the example of what will slow this down if you eat what type of food. 
fatty foods. Yeah, things that are really dense proteins or fats slow it down. So there are a lot of factors that can affect your emptying speed. But in this situation, it's typically because the pyloric sphincter doesn't want to relax completely. So that food just keeps churning in there and churning and churning and it's nasty. It could be a blockage. You, know, you hear that more in like dogs, especially in Labradors. Anybody have a Labrador? They they have like pica something fierce. They eat anything. They eat rocks. That's crazy. But yeah, I still live with a veterinarian and she was always complaining about you know, these Labrador you know, eating this. Like a whole greenie, those chewy things. So they just bloop. It's yeah, it sucks. Those don't digest so well. But it could be, you know, it could be a kid that was eating something and got lodged in here. What was that disease I just mentioned that they eat all kinds of things? I got it. It's named after the bird magpie that just eats things at random. Okay, um, so another thing is pyloric stenosis. I don't know if that's on the slide. Yeah. So pyloric stenosis is where there's swelling or inflammation and you can't open pyloric region. So it may be that the muscle doesn't want to relax. Maybe it's that there's swelling or inflammation. There's the irritation. And then you can see the, the different problems. The food just backs up there. It sits there and basically stagnates and it's nasty and then causes the irritation of the lining. It makes you vomit and get sick. And in those situations, surgical treatment is usually necessary. Okay. And then gastritis. Typically, not always, but when you see gastric Anything, it means stomach related. Almost always. So, gastritis is talking about inflammation in the stomach. And they typically diagnose this by actually sticking the tube down your throat and observing it. So, in the endoscope observation. And there are a lot of things that can cause it. can be drugs. Aspirin has a tendency to cause gastritis, it can be alcohol. And then you can even subdivide what part of it is. So fundal is referring to the fundus, of course, at the top. Ant is referring to the, the bottom. If it were right in the middle, what would they call it? Chronic body gastritis. Can you think of a bacteria that could cause this? Anybody remember? H. pylori, yeah. Helicobacter pylori, H. pylori. So inflammatory disorder, acute versus chronic talks with a time frame. If peptic ulcers. Peptic ulcers when you're starting to erode the outer layer of the mucosa. Can you remember what's so special about the stomach mucosa? It's thick, but it's also very basic. Why does it have to be basic? So the acid doesn't make it all the way through. So another problem is that as you age, those cells that are making the mucus, the mucosal cells, what happens to them? As you age, they all... They, they actually they just don't work as well as they used to. So what? Who has a tendency to get a lot of ulcers? Elderly people, yeah. And it's because their stomach lining is not working the way that it used to. Um, I'm trying to think of a really good example. I know back in the '80s, not because I remember it, but because I've written up research on it. But they used to think that it was stress was the primary cause. Stress made way too much stomach acid, and that stomach acid just eroded right through the lining. But what they actually found is there was one guy that he said, well, I think it's a bacteria, and everybody laughed at him, because what about the stomach made them think that the bacteria could be there? So acidic, yeah. When you eat a probiotic, they promote, oh, good GI tract health. But you know what? As soon as that probiotic hits your stomach, guess what happens? Killed. Very few actual bacteria get down into the small intestine. Most of them are killed in the stomach. So things like that H. pylori, H. pylori has ammonia around the outside, it gets down in here and it works its way through. Until it finally starts irritating that lining, the lining can't make mucus, and also destroys it. So one of the most common causes of actually peptic ulcers is the bacteria. Um, another common cause is age. Just aging. If you can avoid it, do it. Mm -hmm. Are you talking about like acidophilus? That's another example too, but there are, there are other probiotics. There's like a long chain of them. Be killed in the stomach. Yeah, they're barely, barely any of them actually make it down to the intestine. Because I always take those after I take antibiotics or something. Because my body's all thrown out. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
because most of the intestinal bacteria you have is actually the same bacteria you had when you were a baby. Because it, when you were a baby, you had such weak stomach acid that the bacteria from mom's skin when she was breastfeeding or everything could go right through and start building up in your GI tract. Lately, they found that you can actually get a fecal transplant, it's one of the hottest new transplants. And because, yeah, if you ate the feces, it's killed and destroyed on the way through, which, why you wouldn't eat feces, I have no idea. Someone was telling me that they will actually put it in your stomach, and I just, I'm thinking, you know what, I didn't want to eat it in the first place, and I definitely don't want a doctor sticking a tube down my throat and putting feces in it. But what they do is they take a transplant from one person, they extract it, they, most of the bacteria in your GI tract, you can't expose the air because then it's, it's killed. So they take it straight into this tube, they put it right up into your chute. <laughs> and they inject it straight in. So that bacteria, once it gets inside of you, it has a party in there. It's, all this good bacteria from them is replicating rapidly and it's destroying or basically pushing out all the bad bacteria. And then they find that that's one of the, one of the best current treatments for Crohn's syndrome. Yeah, so, I mean, I've gone to neighbors before and asked, for, asked if they had an extra little cup of coffee or sugar or something. And, you know, someday you'll be knocking on the door saying, hey, you got the, some food like a bar? <laughs> but they tell you, find somebody that, when they do the transplant, find somebody that has a diet similar to yours because that way the bacteria can handle your diet. Yeah, so I'm going to have to go on one of those, like, transplant lists if I ever have a problem because people that eat spicy stuff like me, they're rare. And then these are ulcers. So you already know the different stages. You know, the superficial stage is going down in, but of course you can't pinch it because it's non palatable But just keeps going deeper and deeper and deeper until it finally hits down the muscularis and then you've got real big pain. Because once it's broken through here, now all that stomach acid has come down and just keeps it really faster and faster and faster. Does that mean you the Yeah, you can get... You get that burning sensation when it starts penetrating through the mucosa and starts hitting the submucosa, but... Yeah, if, if you're doubled over, it's probably way really deeper than that. So there's some other chemicals out there that can cause it, too. Um, it's kind of a myth that it's a common thing, but it does cause it, like caffeine, alcohol. So for, for those to affect it, you are usually an alcoholic, or I don't know, is there really a name for a caffeine hawk, like a coffee hawk? But it's people that go way overboard because the alcohol gets in and screws up all those cells along the membrane. The caffeine does the same thing. Caffeine actually increases stomach acid release. And we already talked about the gastric ulcers, stress ulcers. Oops. And these are related to some other type of illness, like severe illness. You can think of them kind of like as a secondary ulcer. We can have one thing called ischemic, which means what's happening. Decreased blood flow. So it could be decreased blood flow for lots of reasons. It could actually be literally stress-related, as if it's decreasing blood flow, but we're talking chronic, chronic stress. So as the blood flow is not going to the, the stomach lining, it decre or decreases the production of all the basic components, decreases the mucus, and then acid could actually get thrown around it. And then Cushing's ulcers. Cushing's ulcers are actually not because of Cushing's disease, by the way. Cushing's ulcers are because of intracranial pressure. Ooh, good question. So, intracranial pressure actually increases the parasympathetic nervous system, which does what to the GI tract? Turns it up. So it's increasing more stomach acid, which actually starts eating away from the lining. Yeah. So you can have think of a tumor. A tumor as the tumor's slowly growing, it's increasing in cranial pressure. Yeah. It's it's where it's located specifically. It's something that's pushing out what nerve that goes to the GI tract in the brain. You better remember from the vagal nerve, yeah. And then post gastrectomy, what's ectomy mean? Yeah, it's taken away, out of me, right? So if it's otomy or ectomy, it means it's taken out of me. Like robotomy. Take a robotomy. You have to say, I don't robot you, you don't robotomy. All right, dumping syndrome is when you're moving the food way too fast. I mean, it literally means what it sounds like. <laughs> There's no trick to that one. 
And I think I actually have a whole slide, the next slide is dedicated to it. So here are some symptoms. Dumping syndrome means that you're moving the food way through, way through too fast. Okay. Alkaline reflux. Alkaline is talking about where's that alkaline stuff coming from. It's not coming from the stomach. Small intestine. Yep. It's coming from the small intestine up into the stomach. And what's it doing to all the acids in the stomach? Neutralizing. Do you need those acids? Yeah. Break down um, proteins to help you to digest viruses, bacteria, all that stuff. Don't even worry about afferent loop. They call it ALO. It's just chronic obstruction. And then diarrhea, weight loss, anemia, all these things. Why anemia? I love this one. Because it seems to pop up over and over. What is in the stomach that, that you need that could cause anemia if you don't have it? There's a special chemical. If you had physiology with me, I know you got heated your head constantly, but anemia, when you eat vitamin B12, it gets in the stomach and it binds to intrinsic factor. So if people have if people have the part of the body taking out that's making lots of intrinsic factor, they can't bind B12. If you can't bind B12, B12 is important for DNA replication for blood cells, which means that you can't replicate the blood cells which gives you something actually called pernicious anemia. Yeah, I, I never remember. Yeah, I just remember the numbers and what they're for. I never remember, like, that whole niacin, riboflavin, pantothoic acid crap. Yeah. I don't even want to take a chance at it because I never remember which one it is. I just took a nutrition class, like, two semesters ago, too, and I forgot it all right. Huh? <laughs> You're taking it now and you've forgotten it? Oh, there you go. You're right with the C word. Cobalamine. Okay, but anyway, these are all things that when you when you get some kind of like a gastrocomy or a bypass, these are symptoms that have a tendency to happen. So dumping syndrome, rapid emptying of time. So it's just moving through really quick. You're not getting a chance to digest the stuff. Think of proteins. This is one example. So proteins are like they're undigested. Can you absorb them like that? No. When you get all those undigested proteins down in the small intestine, they can't handle it. What does it make that solution? Hypotonic, hypertonic, or isotonic down in the small intestine? Very hypertonic. What's a hypertonic solution to you and your cells? Does it add water to the cells or take it away? It pulls water out. So if those proteins are stuck in your intestinal tract, what's it doing with the water? Putting the water into your blood or putting it into the intestinal tract? Putting it into the intestinal tract. What's it making your, your feces? Very watery, very loose stools. Yeah. So you get a lot of watery, loose stools. So it just empties way too fast. And about 45% of people that get gastrectomies get this problem. Which kind of helps what they got it for in the first place because what else are they losing? Weight. They're losing nutrients, so they're losing weight, too. All right. And then I just kind of talk about this. Next one is... Oh, we didn't even take a break, did we? It's been an hour and 20 minutes. We'll take a break and then talk about the guts and intestines.